Good morning, everybody. I think it's time for a countdown. It's very early this Sunday morning. I'm glad you came here. Probably it's never too early to discuss militarism. <laughs> so welcome, welcome to you. Um, my name is Milos Vets. I am a permanent fellow at the IWM, who is a co-organizer of the Vienna Humanities Festival. And I'm also a law professor at the Faculty of Law here in Vienna. I have two ladies on the podium. We will discuss gender and militarism. Um, I will introduce them to you in a second. Then we will have probably around 35 minutes of a discussion. And then I would like to open the floor to you, to your comments, observations, discussion, critique also. And then we will stop at uh, sharp one. Um, I start with introduce. Oh, I forgot to mention this is an event in cooperation with the OIIP, the Österreichisches Institut für Internationale Politik. Um, I am starting with introducing Saskia Stachovic. She just said she's born and raised Viennese, and now uh, she has a chair at um, the University of Vienna. She has a number of fields which are very much related with today's topics, therefore I will read them. Critical security and military studies, feminist and post-colonial theories and in international relations, privatization of security, private military and security companies, gender and security, gender and the military, EU border security, transnational actors, and finally parliamentarism, anti-Semitism, and the political history of Austrian Jews. She was previously affiliated scholar at uh, the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of California in Berkeley. She was Else Richter Fellow, Erwin Schrödinger Fellow, and also visiting postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bristol. Her dissertation um, was about gender ideologies and military labor markets in the US under the supervision of Eva Kreisky. And her diploma thesis was about frontier ideals and political identity in the US. We will come back to these topics when we discuss uh, military and gender issues and um, because these are very important fields of reference. Nilifer Demel is professor at Sri Lankan University of Colombo and currently visiting fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences, the EVM. Her fields of interest are cultural post-colonial gender performance and film studies. Um, previously, no, currently and previously, she was head of department of English at the University of Colombo. She was director of the international unit at the University of Colombo, director of studies at the Faculty of Arts. Um, she received her PhD in English at the University of Kent in UK, her MA at the university, and please do help me with the pronunciation. Perdenia. Many thanks, Perdenia in Sri Lanka. And before that, uh, she was assistant lecturer at the Department of English at the University of Kelanya, also in Sri Lanka. Um, so they do have seen some fields in common in your research history, so to say. And I would like to start the discussion with how would you define militarism? Nilofar, maybe you could have a start with that topic. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, it's, uh, first of all, it's wonderful to be here. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Um, I would uh, define militarism really um, as an ideology that, in a way, it's an ism, but a very important part of militarism, and it cannot live on its own, um, is that it requires a process of militarization. And militarization, so in a way, I use 
the two terms interchangeably, militarism and militarization. And militarization would be the mechanism, the process by which we actually begin to consent to military options for intractable, so-called intractable solutions. And uh, where we begin to accept um, the military as part and parcel of civilian life, I'm saying we in an informed way. Um, and so that's basically how I would, I would define it. Militarism for me is an ideology and militarization is the process and mechanism that supports it. Many thanks. We will talk in the next 30 minutes a lot about the factors, the problems, and maybe also possible solutions uh, uh, in this field. But first of all, Saskia, would you agree or would you like to add something or would you like to take something out of that definition? Well, first of all, good morning and thanks for having me. I'm one of the two ladies who gets to discuss militarism. Um, excuse my voice, I'm a bit, I have quite a cold. Um, I think Nelleva has already raised the most important points. I think, especially if we talk about gender, we have to move away from an understanding of militarism as this is when a state, you know, increases its military capacities in terms of personnel, resources, and so on. And um, understand militarism in broader terms as a, as a mindset that privileges military logics, military means, military solutions to political problems and social issues. Um, and it's an ideology, if you will, that also gives higher status to people, institutions, values that are associated with the military. Um, and that is not, you know, reduced to institutions. So it has a lot to do with our everyday uh, militarization, the term was already uh, brought up, uh, a process by which military power is normalized, war is normalized, uh, and this cannot be done in institutions alone. It's done in movies, it's done in sports, it's done in fashion, so on university campuses. So it's a process that permeates all kinds of institutional and also informal spaces. Yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, an ideology, yes, but I think not only. Um, it's also very closely tied to the political economy of the war system, so how is money made in that context, by who and off of who. Um, so it's not just how we think, but also how, we, how society produces and reproduces itself. Many thanks. I had the pleasure to read a lot of your both papers, and your fields of reference are sometimes converging, but empirically from different political and geographical contexts. So I would like to ask you to explain to the audience how you came to it, how the conflict in Sri Lanka fueled your research, and if you could give some examples of that, what Zaskia just said, you know, you, people through militarism gain a higher status, which is really an issue, what I understand, when you're making the, the opposition of the, the garment girls, but, but I think you could do that uh, much better than me. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are uh, familiar with the Sri Lankan war, uh, but basically it was over uh, the forming of a separate state, a Tamil state of Elam, um, and uh, it was a war fought between the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, called the LTTE, and the Sri Lanka government. It started in 1983 and ended in May 2009, so it was a 26-year war, which is a very long time. Um, the, of course, as all wars are, it was brutal. Uh, caused a lot of, well, apart from the deaths, um, multiple internal displacements and refugees and so on and so forth. Um, the LTT was also uh, in South Asia at any rate, one of the organizations that um, used and weaponized bodies uh, because they had suicide bombing squads. At the same time, uh, the, Sri Lanka the Sri Lanka armed forces also fought to a finish, and um, it was extremely costly. The estimate is that about 100,000 people uh, were killed in this war. Living and working in Sri Lanka during this time 
it was impossible not to engage with it in some way. And I was politically sort of active in women's groups that were, were really advocating for a political settlement rather than a military settlement to the war. Uh, we also used our teaching to talk to students at the university. Uh, but writing about it, analyzing it, trying to understand the processes at work was a very important way for me personally to respond to the war. I also had friends and mentors like Neelan Thiruchalvam who were assassinated by the LTT during the war. Um, and so it became a very personal kind of effort for me. Um, in, and that's how I came to write uh, my book, Militarizing Sri Lanka. And also because as Saskia said, nobody had really looked at the Sri Lankan war in relation to popular culture, to memory, uh, to women's movements, etc. So I felt that was what I really wanted to bring onto the table, also because that is my training. Um, so that's the geography and the political context uh, from which I approached uh, writing about this. And for me, the process, uh, the processes of militarization were very important. The one thing about militarism is that, and militarization, is that it starts a long time before the actual war. So in Sri Lanka, the war started officially in July 1983 after the ambush of 13 soldiers, uh, Sri Lanka government soldiers by the LTT, and that's the official start of the war. But we could see living in Sri Lanka from about the late 70s onwards, uh, increased army checkpoints, uh, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, uh, which became law in 1978, uh, we all had to carry national identity cards. Uh, we used to be checked regularly. Um, and in terms of films and advertisements and TV, you could see a sort of rhetoric uh, and discourse starting. Uh, and so it always starts before the war and lasts much longer than the guns have fallen silent. So we are still Ten, almost 10 years after the war uh, was declared over, we still have facets of militarization and militarism that we can see in society. So you just became aware of it and alert to it and try to take a critical distance from it um, and write about it. So that was my process. Many thanks. Also, I think it's very impressive and interesting how you conceptualize your personal role as a teacher and an activist also. And I will ask you something similar about your role later on. But first, I would like to ask you about your perception, your empirical research in terms of militarism. Where did you see that? Where did you observe that? You made a very interesting studies about the Nepalese Gurkha, but you had lots also uh, work done on discourse studies? Well, uh, I think I have to start at the start, which is uh, my PhD on, on military women in the US armed forces. Uh, and it's not surprising to find militarism in military institutions, right? But still, that brought up a lot of issues um, about the relationship between feminism and militarism. What does it mean for a feminist, for example, to serve in the armed forces? Is she a true feminist or isn't she? Uh, and, and engaging with these women as well, who were like, who are you to tell me what a feminist does and doesn't? Uh, so I'd say, studying military institutions uh, brings forward a lot of issues about what is feminism, who is a feminist, um, is military integration something that we should strive for or not, and who is to decide that. So that is one site of encounter with this. Another, and that already came up during uh, this work, was private military and security companies. Because I was doing this work on, on the state forces, realizing that there's a whole other world, or not other world, it's very much connected, but um, that was at a point where every second person deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan was a private contractor and not a, a state um, troop. So privatization, that's also uh, a big field of mine where, where 
Well, these are private companies. They're commercial. They, they want to offer services and make money off of it. But of course, that's very much tied to militarism again as something that gives authority uh, in terms of how do we solve security problems. So the relationship between security and militarism uh, being very prominent here. The study you're bringing up uh, about the Nepalese uh, Gurkha, I have to give lots of credit to my co-author here, Amanda Chisholm. She did the, uh, the field work with the, for this one. Um, and what we did, that's an old feminist point to say, don't just look at the institution, look at the surroundings. So very early on, feminists did not only study the military, but they studied military households, military wives. What do they contribute? How do do they uh, sustain the war system and how are they really pivotal for doing that? It can't be done without the women, it can't be done without the families. And uh, what we did there was uh, take that to the private military and security industry and ask, uh, so who's sustaining that? You know, that's not a, an official state institution, but Still, I mean, there's for sure there's emotional, there's physical, there's reproductive labor being done there that we don't see if we just study those companies. Uh, so what Amanda did, and I uh, contributed a little bit to that, was a look at the, the Gurkha. I don't know who's familiar with this uh, group. Uh, this is a group referred to as a martial race. So these were Indians, uh, Nepalese, uh, who served in the Imperial British Army and are now being reintegrated, if you will, in the private security market, where they're being marketized as these super fierce and super loyal and great warriors that are being now, you know, uh, marketized on that, in that context. And that brings another level, because we're not only talking about how does a military recruit from its national uh, recruitment pool, but how does it go to the global south and uh, get military labor from there. And of course, there's households, women that support that, that live in Nepal for two years without their husbands being there and who need to do that labor for the private security market to work and for those companies to make a profit. Many thanks. I really found fascinating reading your both work that you could see like in a nutshell how the global and the local interact. Also, I mean, you're talking about these private companies, but at the same time, it's very clear that the dichotomy of private and public somehow is being blurred. Also, the dichotomy of war and civil war is not very clear. And even the dichotomy of war and peace is often transgressed. In your case, talking about militarized societies, you still feel that there is something like an ongoing war, civil war, at least mindset. Okay, so th this gives us a lot to think. Also, as you mentioned, um, conflict, securitization, and war. I mean, this is a famous term from social sciences, securitization, so the whole mindset goes into the way of that we need more security, which is a justification narrative very often of militarization. But before I get into details here, I would like to switch now to the gender issue. What happens with the gender relations, with discrimination, equality, and so on? In, Let's start with your case and your environment, Nilofer. Thanks, and Saskia, thanks for bringing up this issue of feminism and militarization. This was really um, a very difficult position for us in the 1990s. You have to remember that the suicide bombings of the LTTE, where the female, the women uh, uh, were, fem were also deployed as suicide bombers, also happened a long time before 9-11. Uh, very often the history of uh, this is uh, sort of talked about now as if this history starts with September 11, 2001. But in fact, um, we, uh, these bombings were taking place in the mid uh, sort of late 1980s. And the, the most famous one probably for the West uh, is in 1991 when uh, an LTTR called Danu assassinated the Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Now what this, the conundrum uh, that uh, we had as feminists in Sri Lanka was how, how do you understand this and how do you explain this? So on the one hand, 
um, you did see women on both sides of the war as people who were really victimized by the war and who had to, uh, who had to, you know, become responsible for their households and their families and so on and so forth and were displaced and <coughs> refugees. On the other hand, um, the presence of these women cadre uh, firmly told us women are not just passive in this war. They're not only the victims. How do you really understand? How, what do you call them? We had no vocabulary at that time, really, uh, to call them. Are they victims? Are they perpetrators? And we went back and forth. So then we called them victim perpetrators or the other way around. And there was this search in the 1990s for a vocabulary and a framing uh, with how to understand these women. And a lot of us, uh, when I think back on the early work that we did, uh, many of us uh, you know, then settled on this idea of ambivalent empowerment. Right, because it was difficult for us to actually call it straightforward empowerment because we also saw that some of these women were not really decision makers within the LTT. Uh, they were also uh, in a way, uh, and, I, and a point that I want to sort of add to Saskia's thing was even as women were part of uh, this liberation struggle and uh, the war, it was really masculinity as an idea that gained the most. Because when you talk to them, what they kept saying was, we are as good as the men. Uh, we are trained as well as the men. Uh, we can match up to the men. And that was, in a way, the standard. And uh, they were not there in decision making. So you could see really that a lot of sort of patriarchy and masculinity really uh, was, did, did gain in the war, in this war, even though there was a significant women cadre that participated on behalf of the LTT. So it, it was a conundrum for us and it took us a while uh, and I'm not sure that the debate has yet settled uh, within the feminists. And uh, from within liberal feminism, it was very clear that if you were part of um, a sort of violence that attacks civilians, then no. You know, it was, un it was to say that you were part of a military movement was unacceptable. But yet there was also, this was also framed as a freedom struggle. This was also framed as minority issues of minorities in Sri Lanka requiring um, uh, a right to uh, determine their own futures, uh, their own education systems, their own political and civil networks and mobility. Um, so it was a very difficult call. And as I said, I'm not sure the debate has yet ended on that. So you said that in the 90s, the conceptualization was somehow a dichotomy of perpetrator and vic victim. victim. How is it now in the year 2018 with these women in the different role? I mean, do you have some kind of language for all these ambivalences and to conceptualize their roles? Um, again, it's difficult. What we have tried to do is historicize each, um, each event or decade that happened. So there was a time in the LTTE the early LTT, where the women were actually very empowered in relation to intellectually empowered. Uh, they really felt themselves part of global movements. Uh, in the 19, late 1970s, there were women who uh, were framing the struggle in relation to what happened in Nicaragua, in Palestine, uh, and so on and so forth. But you could see that by the time it came to the 2000s, uh, the LTT had lost that generation of women in its, uh, in its cadre. Uh, the women they were recruiting were younger and younger, uh, with very little education about this prior revolutionary history. They had no sense of belonging to that international history. And you really felt that, you know, they were going along with what was being told. Um, but it wasn't, 
that simple because as feminists you also don't want to talk about false consciousness right uh, you want to say okay there is you know that uh, these people have have uh, made choices and these choices are informed choices so i'm really not sure that uh, a, you know beyond this framing of ambivalent empowerment uh, we are at any better uh, framing than we are today particularly so so the in, in a way the response to your question has been it's what we did was historicize uh, each set of events and people as it happened rather than give like some kind of blanket terminology okay um, so there is some kind of ambivalence if you have women fighters as you said bombers in terms of equality emancipation and they are still i mean they are empowered and perpetrators but they are still victims at the same time um, Zaskia you have a great, you have chosen a really great title for your dissertation Uh, that fits, I think, very well into uh, this um, ambivalence. May you quote it and may you say how you came uh, to that? Can you remind me? It's a, oh my some God. time ago. <laughs> Now I will have uh, Because the book had a different title. I do know the book, but that was not very cleverly titled. Uh, I'm so sorry. I did not take the book with me, so I have just uh, the name. So it's The Equal Opportunity to Die for Your Country. Right, yeah. <sighs> I'm really Thank you. <laughs> okay, so equal opportunity to die. I found that a great title expressing all these ambivalences going along with militarization and uh, connecting gender issues. C can you give some evidence about what, what is happening in the United States, about the discussions there? Well, the title, what I did in, in that study was to look at how does the image of military women change over time and what does it have to do with how much they are needed in the military. And surprisingly, whenever there's a big need for female, female workforce, then women can do anything, right? Um, and when the forces reduce personnel and when people are let go and then women are suddenly terrible at everything. Um, so this... This quote came from a newspaper article that was very critical of women's military integration and said, why do you even want this? And this is crazy. You shouldn't want this. You should something, want something else. And um, Which newspaper was that? That was either the New York Times or the Washington Post. I'm not sure. Uh, and I thought... Huh. So who gets to decide what women can want and what is a worthwhile you know, engagement for them? And I think these are probably two separate questions. The one is, should women be in the military, which is a moot question because they already are. The question is, are we going to see that and accept that and give them the credit and privileges that come from military service or not? Um, And should they be there? And why? Why should they be there? And then there's always this point about, oh, women you know, are more ethical and women have better social skills and women are less militaristic, so bring them into these organizations and make them more gender-friendly and make them more peaceful. And I'm not a big fan of that argument. I think women should be wherever there's you know, um, power and money. Uh, they should have equal access to that. Not because they're better or they will change the institution, but because it's their right. You know, Just a very basic rights-based argument for women's military integration. The other question is, do we want the military to be a central institution in um, our society? Do we want it to be privileged in how we go about solving social issues and political problems and how we um, engage in world affairs as a global actor? And that's, of course, a very diff different conversation to be had in the US or here, uh, where women are virtually non-existent in the military. So yeah, um, all of these questions that the Nelofer already brought up, should women be there, why should they be there, what's the overall aim and what's the overall aim of feminism? Is it bringing women into every powerful institution or is it abolishing the war system and militarism? And my s simple answer is both, of course. We need to do both. Uh, probably not the same person can do both and everyone has to decide which is their you know, best field of 
of engaging with these issues, but I think we have to have both. And what I see today for military women in the US, they have not been part of a feminist struggle or movement for decades, and this has set them back. So only now are they beginning to see also on an individual level, there's theories, there's concepts, there's a whole field of research that explains why we're being sexually harassed, why we're being discriminated against, and what we can do about it. And I think it's not for us to say, this is not something we want to be a part of. Reading your thesis, I learned that there are many justifications of discrimination of women in the armed forces, um, and there are a lot of stereotypes evoked in that. So. You are saying now that the women are fighting uh, that discrimination also. Uh, can you name some arguments and counter-arguments of that debate which is currently going on? Well, I mean, the, the arguments are pretty much the same. They just, they just change in frequency. So, um, so the, the stereotypes are the same, but they are just mobilized in a different yeah, ways? Yeah, I think so. Uh, because there's, there's obviously a physical argument, so women can't do as many push-ups as men, they don't have the upper body strength and all these arguments. Um, but what I found in my research is that a lot more prevalent are the arguments about their mental fitness. They can't take it, you know? They, they are just not as uh, mentally and psychologically strong and they cannot be part of that band of brothers that goes out and does, does these important jobs. So physical, mental, a lot of sexualized arguments. When women are there, men can't, you know, keep their hands to themselves. It's going to destroy the whole uh, morale and everything, that uh, unit cohesion, everything that holds a military together um, so you're going to have sexual violence so you better just leave the women out and not have it but, like that. But, in, sorry, but in fighting discrimination yeah. if women are targeting discrimination are they also in favor of an equality argument that just says no we are not different Huh, that's different. That's difficult, and especially in a military context, where you really don't want to argue that you're not as um, you know military uh, and not as uh, militaristically strong, and all of these images uh, of what it entails to be a soldier. So that's tricky for them, um, and. Here you can really see how the arguments changed because in the 1990s, for example, it was very much about women can just do the job like any man, just have you know equal standards for both, look who's best qualified and then get the best troops. And it was a very gender neutral argument, if you will. And then later on, especially since 9-11, you've had this argument that women should be there because they are different in a way, you know, they're culturally sensitive, they can engage with the local population, they have those social skills. I think that's a dangerous argument because it always sets women apart um, and it discourages an institution to, to instill all these skills and qualifications in the men, just saying, you know, we have the women there to do that and these are always the soft skills and we know that the soft skills are always, you know, understood as less valuable um, and then you have the men to do the real job. Many thanks. Um, looking at the U.S. Army, I assume there is a lot of technological transformation. Um, Mary Calder has been invited last year to the IWM and gave a lecture about her theory of the so-called new war. And the new war is transforming um, many things and its expression of transformations at the same time. Um, it is very clear that this also enables women to participate in warfare because it's technological, it's very often remote and so on, so it's not about physical power, it's about remote control and pressing a button and so on. So I, I assume there will be a lot uh, in uh, context of the US Army about that, but I would like to ask you how, do you, do you have such a technological transformation also in Sri Lanka. I, from what you said, it's very clear that there is a strategic transformation of warfare with the suicide bombers, which also enabled women actually uh, to participate in the combat. So you, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think um, 
you know, to go to Saskia's point about the women saying they're mentally fit has been important also for this shift that's taking place. So even if they don't, you know, they, of course, in, 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 in terms of Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka army itself has very little. There's just one division. Uh, there's a women's army corps, but that's very small. Uh, so in terms of the Sri Lankan war, it was the LTT women that were much more at the fore. And they had to be frontline combatants uh, when the men died. So it, you know, it was kind of their turn. But the, the real shift uh, that I see f in terms of your question from um, te the, the conventional technology to smart technology is in post-war um, counterinsurgency operations. What we see happening in Sri Lanka today is uh, where from very physical army checkpoints, you have much more uh, deployment of digital surveillance. And uh, in a way, in one of the pieces I wrote, I've called it from militarization to securitization. Uh, because you don't see the military hardware as much anymore, and you see the securitization. So in fact, uh, there's a move to bring digital ID cards, uh, and so on and so forth. That would then be networked and become part of big data. And that shift is happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, it has international support. There are international companies and corporations uh, providing the hardware and the software, uh, etc. And I, so I think that uh, is where I would really mark the technological shift. And of course, it's very it, it's better for governments because this is a very, uh, it's, it's a kind of um, hidden way of surveying a hostile population and keeping tabs on them. Um, so uh, this is, yeah, this is, this is how it's going. Okay. Can I make two points about uh, technology and, and gender and militarism? There's this perception that women are just being more integrated into the military because they can now do the stuff that the military does in terms of technology. But that relationship is complicated because what really happens when militaries become more technologically advanced is that you need different staff. If you have 10% of your fighting force in combat and the rest is really just doing infrastructure, logistics, medical, da 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 you need different workforce. You need to recruit differently and you cannot just take every guy that comes to the recruitment office. So this has really changed uh, how the U.S. has to find their recruits. Uh, they have to turn a lot of people down um, and they have to have more qualified personnel. And this really ushered women in because on the average they had higher educational standard and also you just couldn't fill the ranks with uh, men anymore, you know? So it's not just very direct, it's also indirect. Many thanks. At the same time, I mean, we know from field studies in the field of information technology that this is also a sector with a lot of sexism. So I'm wondering if that maybe even fuels the problem of inequality and discrimination. So, but this is just an assumption. Before I open the discussion, I would like to raise one more uh, aspect and address popular culture. You both worked on popular culture and the representation of equality, warfare, gender and militarism. So thinking about popular movies like Zero Dark Thirty with, in that case, powerful women vulnerable at the same time, I'm wondering if popular culture is part of the solution or part of the problem. Definitely it's both, but how would be your assessment? Is it more part of the solution or more part of the problem? In Sri Lanka it has been more part of the problem because um, the, just the capital required, say, for movies uh, tends still to come from um, corporate entities or even the Sri Lanka government, uh, then that would have a particular agenda. And uh, what gets played is popular songs or TV serials. Um, the, the biggest television channel is still sort of state-owned and state-run. 
um, and so it remains uh, part of the problem. The uh, where culture, I mean, so the the difference is popular culture, as in sort of mass produced and appealing to mass audiences, is always produced as such, and the state still has uh, the bigger share in producing and the ability uh, to produce it as such. So I see that, it as that, part of the problem. That is a very clear answer. Some more ambivalences uh, in your case? Some <laughs> I'm afraid not, especially if you look at the US context where the, the armed forces really directly sponsor and give money to big uh, blockbuster movies. And even absurdly, you know, where there's no military theme and suddenly the people have to, I don't know, do their musical on a, on a military uh, base. So then you can look up who did the funding for that project and you'll see. So in terms of what movies cost, if we just say in that sector uh, and uh, how they're being produced, how they're being financed, there's very little room. Of course, popular culture and counterculture and uh, subculture, youth culture, there's lots of layers to popular culture that they, of course, have also uh, a moment of resistance. May I ask you about something uh, particular? Have you seen Black Mirror, some of the... Okay. No, okay, because that might be different. Okay, now it's your time. Who would like to ask something, to know something? Please. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the talk. Um, I just wanted to, in both, thank you. it's a great uh, evocation of, you both have talked about environment, uh, women's environment and thinking of women in an environment in various ways. I wonder uh, if you're following from the last question actually, how have they been also a target of effect? Because obviously women are essentialized as being effective in terms of having these soft skills and so on. But in terms of recruitment or how they're brought into the armed military fold, especially today, how are they targeted as, how do we appeal to women's affect? How do we militarize them? Thank you. I would like Can to I start? start? Yes, please. Can I, uh, great question, and I want to bring in another, well, it's not really, for me, in the post-war moment, they're not being targeted by the military, but they're being targeted by the peace industry. And this idea that Saskia brought out before, that women have, uh, you know, this, this burden uh, to be pacifist and peace-loving, etc., and so therefore we want them in the military. You can see this happening in terms of the peace industry, including uh, the women's movement. And now there is a backlash, actually, saying, why should it be the case that women have to bear the disproportionate responsibility and burden of uh, peace and coexistence in the communities and where the men are really not even targeted. So you really see that, uh, a very essentialized way in which women are being deployed in the peace industry in the post-war context in Sri Lanka. Um, hmm. How women targeted? Very differently. Recruitment is a very gendered site, obviously, um, and uh, a lot of recruitment still supports this, well, basically sells masculinity, saying, you know, if you join the armed forces, you become a real man and so on and so forth. But there's other layers as well, um, and a lot of recruitment in the U.S. is also around you can get a good education, you can go to college, all of these things, and they're also specifically targeted at, w at women, and also they have women on their poster, and so on. Uh, they really do need the women in the US, so that's a big difference to here, where you might see uh, a female soldier on a poster, but there's no real um, engagement with what does that mean, uh, if we want to have more women, how do we as an institution have to address that? Yeah, thank you very much. There are so many aspects that you have touched. Um, one aspect you did not touch, but I, maybe it's even it's a bit on the margin of, of our topic, uh, the link to, uh, of the military with the sex industry and, and, and human trafficking and then the Balkan Wars and the run that so we have so, so much testimony. Um, as reaction to that, the United Nations Security Council has issued this uh, rather known um, 
uh, resolution uh, 1325 on women, peace and security, which has a very binary um, idea about gender. Here are the women, here are the men, and the women are the good, and the men are the, the problem, the men are the killers, the women are the peacemakers. Um, I would like some of your, uh, your comments on that uh, resolutions and the, and the uh, content of the resolutions also that uh, uh, criticized uh, sexual violence against women in war, but this sexual violence was in, in, in that resolution committed by men against uh, women in, in Congo, etc. We have so much testimony on that. But I also would like to raise uh, uh, a question on, on, on gender. Yeah? You have also talked in the binary idea about the women and the men, but men are also uh, sexually harassed in the military. There is a discrimination of uh, homosexual women and men, and I would like to hear from you your thoughts on whether this binary idea about gender is not dissolved when we talk about uh, all these complicated and, and, and complex aspects of uh, gender and militarism. Many thanks. There were a lot of interesting remarks and arguments. I appreciate that. So, who would like to for? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that you brought up a very, very important aspect. So, 30, you know, 1325 and the critiques of it go to what I touched on, which is uh, the peace industry that, that in a way fueled because a lot of aid came through the UN Resolution 1325. Uh, but, and the way it was um, it was interpreted uh, was that they should empower women uh, to take part more in peace processes. Now, in a way, it has a history in Sri Lanka because uh, there have been various peace processes that were brokered, and in none of those peace processes, except the last one, uh, where there was a gender subcommittee, were women very involved. So I think women's groups were also responding to the absence of women at the decision-making level uh, in the peace processes. And, you know, 1325 was very much about that. How do we get women onto the peace table and being in, actively involved in, in the peace process? I'm very glad that you brought up this issue of um, that the men are not always the perpetrators. Uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, the reports out has been that there's a lot of sexualized torture of men, uh, particularly when they're taken in as detainees, um, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, in the Sri Lankan case, there has been, uh, the rapes in war have been less weaponized. Uh, it was not systemically used in the Sri Lankan war. So you don't, there are some very landmark cases of, was uh, that due to training or moral attitudes or legal, how you say, restrictions? What, what, what was the reason why did this not happen? Okay, I think uh, it's not to say it didn't happen, but it didn't happen on the scale that it has happened in other wars. So there are uh, many reasons. One was that the war, um, the Sri Lanka army, for instance, was never a settler army. So, in the sense that the, the battlefields were in the north and the east of the country, where Sri, the Sri Lankan army had camps, but surrounded by LTT areas. So, they did not, uh, for instance, go on mass rapes of villagers, etc., of Tamil villagers, right? Where you did have uh, the issue of sexualized violence was uh, in the mobility of Tamil women uh, to move about because there was so much sec uh, surveillance on the part of the Sri Lanka army. On the part of the LTT again, they were confined to the north and the east, which were Tamil and Muslim areas. Uh, so they weren't really in so-called quote-unquote enemy areas. Again, I think one of the things that prevented the LTT from doing this was they had a significant women's cadre. And I think it is the case that if armies have significant women's cadre, then possibly there is some kind of a prevention of, of weaponizing rape, uh, mass scale, in war. So 
there were these um, elements to the Sri Lankan war that somehow prevented it from uh, being used in the way it was in the Yugoslav wars, etc. Saskia. There were a lot of uh, layers to your question. Uh, let me just briefly focus on 1325. Uh, which was such a, an achievement, right, to securitize gender issues, finally have um, gender inequality be addressed at the UN Security Council. But a few years on, we know that this had some implications that were not planned for, and that one of them is the centrality of sexual violence, which is now at the core of all of these discussions that we're having about gender and security. And this is an important aspect, but it shouldn't be everything, uh, especially because it, it reproduces this idea of women as the eternal victims. And it has the effect, you're right, uh, to erase uh, sexual violence against men. Uh, and it also, research has shown this, it, it supports a notion, very essentialized notion of women. Um, and also very culturalist ideas about, you know, they are the ones that can bridge uh, the divides with other cultures and also, you know, to gather intelligence and so on. But yeah, so a few very problematic things that are written into the resolution and also the, the resolutions that, that are to follow. And I think that's a major challenge. How do we address that and, and steer that back onto <laughs> where we want it? Uh, and the second question is about the binary uh, notion of gender in all of these integration discussions. And we haven't touched upon this at all, but I think it's hugely important, uh, the abolishment of don't ask, don't tell in the US military, which was very controversial, of course, but it, it, was, it could be done, and it was done. Uh, but if we talk about transgender ban, then that's a whole different story, where they come up with all of these bogus arguments why this can't happen. Um, and I just uh, spoke to Aaron Belkin, who was, you know, the most important person in, in bringing uh, down Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he said it's, it's a difficult spot to be in, you know. How do you argue for the integration of people into the armed forces where you know that these pe people will suffer uh, disproportionately and will be discriminated against? Many thanks. Uh, I, I just want comment. to also add something. Um, the issue also with um, conflict-related sexual violence, as it has been framed, is that it automatically makes us go towards rape in war. And there has been a very important critique of that, that in fact there's a range of sexual violences that take place in war that never gets talked about or really addressed for the predominant um, uh, sort of um, preoccupation uh, with wartime rape. Thank you. Um, I want to thank our uh, speakers very much for these interesting uh, introductions. And I think I see some links between the two talks. And uh, my question is about this, is about ambivalent empowerment, um, which I would say, so my first question is, do I understand that correctly? Um, where you would call empowerment when women at the individual level feel that they are strengthened in um, expanding on the role that's given to them in society. Um, and it becomes ambivalent when it is to a certain degree expanding, but to another degree um, integrating them very firmly into a type of mainstream uh, activity, in this case militar militarization. And, um, uh, Saskia Stasovic uh, said that actually according to you there's two things that are necessary both the integration of women in the army and if I, if I simplify it and this feminist critique on militarization so uh, there's of course a link right so between this ambivalent empowerment which would be a kind of a successful let's say integration element where this critique element is lacking. So um, my question then would be how, given that empowerment is something that functions at the individual level, what, what's the actual motivation of, um, you said something about the US Army, but you didn't say something about the fighters, the women fighters in Sri Lanka. What's, what's their motivation? Uh, to have this equal opportunity to die and to actually die. 
Um, what comes to mind for me is, is this old book of Antonia Fraser about warrior queens, um, which shows that it's perfectly possible for women to engage in war uh, using classic elements of femininity, right? So it's all about motherhood, you know, remember um, Leila Khaled, uh, one of these uh, uh, Palestine uh, uh, fighters who said she was doing it for the children of Palestine, so she was killing people for the freedom of children, so it's like a symbolic motherhood. So motherhood, or it's God that told me, like Jean d'Arc was doing, which like makes you transcend femininity, so if you could Many comment thanks. on this, thank you. Thank you for that set of questions, should I go first? Yeah, okay, thanks Micah. Um, I think the issue of ambivalent empowerment became the most troubling for us in relation to understanding suicide bombings. Because the woman did not live, she died. Of course she became a martyr. And the LTT was also very careful. Uh, they really looked after the family. So economically, uh, they would look after the family um, once you were dead. So there was a material benefit uh, to the family that you came from. But where the woman was concerned, she was silenced forever. There was also, uh, uh, it was also very secretive. So there were two uh, suicide uh, carders. One was called the Black Tigers and the other was the Black Sea Tigers. So the Sea Tigers was the Naval Brigade and the other was the Black Tigers. And, and they did not, for instance, have videos, etc., before their bombings. Not that the videos represent, I mean, it's, 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 it's a representation, uh, but um, the, there was a lot of anonymity. You, you, it was very difficult to get to know who was in it. Uh, they were sworn to secrecy. And so, uh, very few testimonies actually have survived of why the women who joined the suicide card in particular uh, joined it. In relation to the others, we have to remember that in the Sri Lankan case, there was no s political settlement. The war was finished militarily, where the, the Sri Lanka government had a decisive military victory over the LTT. What this meant was that the women who participated in the military uh, in fact, uh, there were uh, out of 11,456 Kader who surrendered to the Sri Lanka army, uh, 2,253 were women. They were sent off to rehabilitation camps within courts and their integration back into society has been not at all perfect. There have been a lot of questions and they have not gone back as empowered people. As I said, they were very young women by the time they were recruited to the last phases of the war. They are then rehabilitated by the Sri Lanka army into things like beauty culture and very conventional uh, gendered skills. And they, they, there's a huge problem in their integration. So I think the ways wars end is also very important in taking into account how women integrate and with what kind of power or not. Saskia, would you have a quick answer? Just very quick about motivations. Uh, my example is probably not as dramatic as, as yours. Uh, and there's often the perception that men join the military because they're so patriotic and they want to fight and they want to be, you know, real tough. And women do it because they want a career and they want social security, which is very often used as an argument against them. But actual studies show that the differences in, in motivations for joining are not that big. You know, uh, it's a good mix between uh, more patriotic and more pragmatic arguments for men and women likewise. Many thanks. Um, we've been talking nearly one hour now about Sri Lanka, Gurkha, United States, but I don't want to conclude without asking you both maybe what does it mean for Austria actually? Would you have any answer to that? I mean, you were addressing also the issue about your own role somewhere transgressing the border of being a mere academic, nearly being a political activist, also with a certain ethical mission and classroom. 
Uh, so that is some kind part of it. Now you are here. Do you have anything to add on that? Well, uh, what I would say is that, um, you know, this society, being in Europe uh, has been uh, extremely illuminating for me at this particular moment of time. Uh, it's a society that has seen what wars do. Um, and it has seen high levels of militarization. Uh, what I palpably feel uh, from the people I have met is an anxiety about political forces that may lead back, may, may not be leading back to the same forms of war that Europe has known before, but to other kinds of social schisms. And I have empathy with that. Um, I can't but have empathy with that coming from a 26-year war and it's a struggle to really come out of that. So um, what, what I would say is even I, I feel that even though Austrian society may not know very much about Sri Lanka, it, it is very aware of all of the general uh, themes and topics that we have talked about and the anxiety that I am feeling affectively by being in Europe at this particular time, taps into that. Saskia, a comment on Vienna and on Austria and gender and militarism. Uh, well, there's various aspects to that relationship. One is, uh, where are the women in our military? Uh, and how do we get them there, honestly? Because I think the Austrian military does need and should try to attract uh, the smart young women that it could. Um, that's one issue. But the larger issue is probably what is a military and what do we want it to be in a peacetime situation? Uh, and in the European context, what is the role of our military? Uh, and that is, I think, a huge question to be answered for Austria and neighboring countries, also as we're approaching um, the realization of PESCO, the um, EU uh, armed forces, if you will. Uh, and also, what does the military do in all other, you know, probably more civilian fields? And border security, of course, comes up as the first and most important issue these days. Uh, what role for the military in border protection? And what are the consequences of militarization in this area? And I think that's, uh, there's probably no issue that is more important to, to address right now. Many thanks, Saskia. Many thanks, Nilo, for many thanks to all of you coming and debating with us. Have a great day. <laughs>